bring a few more people in as people get settled. 187, if you want to use your hymn book. In the garden, 187. say it's so hard to do this without you so thank you we have um, our prayer sheets if you don't have those uh, there's some on the podium back here we're going to be in psalms 19 the entire chapter and uh, last time I, I was told that i kept y'all too long and uh, i plan on uh, keeping you probably too long tonight so we'll have to see we'll, we'll see how it goes if you see me look down every once in a while at my phone, it's just me going, ah, they got another 10 minutes in them. We can do that. We, but now we, uh, we're going to be in Psalms 19. I, I love this psalm. We're talking David. It's another uh, psalm of David. Anytime you got, you're dealing with the things of David and what he's been going through in his life and bringing it out into psalms, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to look at. Now, he... Let me explain before we get into it. He's going to kind of take us through a journey of what we call in theology special revelation versus general revelation. Now, just fancy ways of saying general revelation is when you go out into the wilderness and you go out into the woods or you go out on the water or you go out in your yard. You look and creation is... Uh, is revealing to you a revelation that there is a creator who made these things, who the complication of that tree, that little flower that uh, I'm often reminded of when Abigail was like two 
and I was taking her for a little toddle around the yard, and she reached down into the grass and pulled out this tiny, itty-bitty little flower, and I had never even noticed these little flowers, and after she did that, I got to looking, and they're all in the grass. I mean, they're, but they're under the grass, you know. We're just stomping all over. And I got to looking at this little thing, and the amount of detail and the beauty in this tiny little flower that's under the foliage of all the yard there that you never even see. It grows, and it dies, and you never know it was there. That's the kind of revelation we're talking about when you can go out and you can go, somebody created all of this. When you go out and look at the stars in the sky and look at the heavens and the, the constellations and the planets and the, the creation around you, it, and it's insane for somebody to say they go out and, I don't know if I've even been recording, I'm sorry. Uh, it's insane if somebody were to go out and find, say, this cell phone laying in the woods and go, my goodness, two million years of evolution and look what came up out of the ground here. This is the least complicated thing you would find in the woods. The complication, the detail, the everything to create a tree, a flower, anything like that that you would find. Nobody would find a watch in the woods and go, well, that just sprung up out of nowhere. You would know somebody created that watch. Somebody created whatever that is you found. But we have a whole group of people that look around at general revelation and go, no God anywhere. So you got to have a brain in your head to understand that there's a God when you look at general revelation. Uh, now the problem is, who is this God? So we can debate that. Is it the God of the Bible? Is it uh, Islam? Is it one of the million, billion gods of Hinduism? Who, who created all of this? Who did all of this? There's a God. That's where special revelation comes in. So special revelation is God revealing himself through his word for us as Christians, the Bible. So let's talk about this. Let's look at Psalms 19 verse 1 for the choir director, and this is David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. So here we have just picture a man walking out and looking up at the heavens and looking at the sky and going, my, 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 look at the hand of God in this place. Okay? So the Psalms are all about bringing glory to God. And this is one of those Psalms. Now, uh, one of my mentors, is he, he went to the hospital to visit a preacher on his deathbed. And the guy, the preacher on his deathbed said, Brother Bobby, we, we missed it. We missed it. He said, what are you talking about? And he said, we've been so worried about numbers and worried about uh, money and worried about all this other stuff. As pastors, he said, it's, there's only one thing, bring glory to God. He said, that's what it's all been about. And then he passed away. And he came to that realization at the end of his ministry. So I want us to be kind of people to understand this. Everything we do, everything we work on as a church, as a group of people, and in our lives is to bring glory to God. And that's what this psalm is about. It begins with the heavens glorifying God. And it ends with, as we go through chapter 19, mankind glorifying God. That's where we get. So in verse 1, you got the praise of creation. Then in 7 through 8, you're going to see the praise of the inspiration of God. And then the concentration, concentration of the heart of mankind in verse 14. That's the path that David takes us on. So let's look at 1 through 6. 1 through 3 starts out again. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of His hands. Verse 2, day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Verse 4, their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens He has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a groom... Okay, coming from the bridal chamber, chamber, it rejoices like an athlete, like a, some of your versions say strong man, like an athlete running a course. In verse 6, 
It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to, uh, to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heart, from its heat. I'm sorry. So, a lot going on here. Now, in verse 5, when it talks about the bridegroom, the, the, like the, the groom coming, the bridegroom cr- coming, in ancient civilization, especially in their time, when you had a wedding, it wasn't like ours, okay, for a lot of reasons. But the main reason, if we have a wedding, do you know that big moment is when that bride comes out, right? And she has never looked so beautiful. And every, what do we do when the bride comes out? We all stand. Everybody's looking at her. The groom's just been up here next to the preacher like a knot on a log the whole time, you know. He does not matter at this point. He's just a means to an end. And so he's just here, and she comes in in all her glory and brought down. Who gives her away? Who this and that? And it's just this big thing for the bride. But in their weddings, the groom was the one. And the bride was kind of sitting over here like she's just lucky to have them, you know. You know, some of y'all women are like, I don't like that. Well, that's the way it was. It's kind of like nature, you know. When you see a cardinal, you know if it's a female or the male. The male is all bright and pretty because he's trying to attract uh, the female. So in the, in the weddings, they would have the bridegroom, and the groom would come out, and he would be dressed in fine clothing, and he would be the one that everybody went, <gasps> when he walked out. And that's the way it was. That's why verse 5 is saying about creation, about it being like a groom. Now, the 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 athlete, the power, the athletic radiance, the, the strong man, some of the versions say, uh, giving you some you know, ways of seeing this. All right, here's the deal. Everywhere you go and everything you look at in nature, and we're talking about nature. These verses have all been talking about nature. When you go out and look at nature, it glorifies God and it brings glory to His name. So you can enjoy creation. You go out fishing, enjoy creation. You're going out hunting, enjoy creation. You're going out hiking, enjoy creation. Go, when you're riding down the road, when you, you know, people love to go ride and look at the foliage when it changes colors and it glorifies God. The mistake is... Mankind has this desire to start, instead of glorifying God, worshiping creation. That's the insanity of it. And that's what goes on. And people are worshiping the sun and worshiping the moon and worshiping stars. And a lot of this stuff going on today with global warming and all these trends and everything is just a repackaging of the worship of creation. Mother Earth, nature, all that. I'm not, Brother Wayne doesn't think we should recycle. I can recycle all you want to. I don't care. I'm just saying it's a repackaging. It is a religion unto itself. By the way, I don't ever see a lot of recycling in this town. We, in Tuscaloosa, recycling's everywhere. Y'all like, just burn it in the backyard. I don't know, y'all. Um, Romans chapter 1, and I'm just going to read it to you. This is the mistake Paul is warning them about. And if you want to write it in the margins of your Bible, and you can write in your Bibles, that's okay. God, God, God likes that. As long as you know, you're writing something good, um, that's what it's there for. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. From the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Paul says, being understood what He has made as a result, people are without excuse for that they knew, they knew God. What does that mean? That means if you walk out into the yard and you look at the tree and you look at the clouds and you look at the sky, you're without an excuse. You've got to know there's God. That's what he's saying. They're without excuse. Just go look around. So, what do we do? They did not glorify God in himself or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became, Paul said, nonsense. They became crazy. And their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. So they're saying, man's lost his mind. He's gone out here and looked at the creation God has made, and then he has decided, I'll worship it. I'll worship things of man, I'll worship things of, of creation, I'll worship whatever. And listen, we go, I'm not into idol worship. We got it all around us, and we can get in it too. It's simple. Anything you put between you and God, that's your idol. It's really that simple. 
God delivered them over. This is what God did. God delivered them over in their cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity. Have you noticed that sexual impurity goes hand in hand with the worship of creation? I mean, what did the pagans do when they were going out into the woods and celebrating? They all stripped their clothes off and run around and that crazy. What did all the temples, when Paul is dealing with the people in the New Testament and the temple, uh, the, the prostitutes in the temples, because that was part of your act of worship, uh, God handed people over. When they start worshiping creation rather than the Creator, one of the things God does is says, if that's what you want, I'll let you have it, and He hands them over to it. And it begins to corrupt the minds and the hearts of people. And he says that sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. Why would we worship something beneath us? We're only to worship He who is above us. So God's like, if you want to worship what's beneath you, and you want to worship the things that are not as wonderful as you are because I created you in my image, I'm going to hand you over to this degraded mindset. And verse 25 says, And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worship and serve something created instead of the Creator who blessed forever. Amen. So creation is meant to bring glory to God, and when you look at it, you're supposed to go, look at what my God did. But mankind, corrupt, worships it. Next verses, all right? Inspirations for His glory. Verse 7 through 11. Now we're going from God's world to God's Word. All right, this is where the specific special revelation comes from. We had general revelation, now it's... The instruction of the Lord is perfect. What is the instruction of the Lord? The Word of God. So the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Remember, the ones that were worshiping creation thought they were wise. They thought they were, but the Bible, Paul was saying they're fools in their own minds. But this Word of God will make you and me, will make us wise. It has a renewing of our life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. This is the testimony of the Lord. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord, the teachings, the instructions, the law of God, the three precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command, see, you can't get this from trees. You can't get this from birds. You can't get this from worshiping creation. You can only get wisdom and you can only get a glad heart and you can only get all that stuff from God revealing Himself to you through His Word. That's the only way. That's why this is so valuable. So the precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. Have you ever read your Bible and you see something you never noticed before and you're like, wow, you know. I remember the first time I ever started reading the Bible. When I got out of high school, and I tell people this all the time because it's true, when I got out of high school, I was on a third grade reading level. And it wasn't until I got saved and got right with God that I started praying constantly because I felt called into ministry. And I said, how am I going to get up and preach and teach and I can't even hardly read? You know, I said, Lord, you've got to work in me. And so I got saved, first thing they did was hand me a King James Bible. And I just about gave up on life, man. I was like, I can't even read this. What are you giving me? But I was reading through the Gospel of John, and, and I'm reading through, and it's Jesus there in the garden, and as Jesus come out of the garden, and the, the Jews are coming to arrest him, and they said, who is Jesus of Nazareth? And Jesus said, I am he, and they fell back from the, and whoo, boy, but my, you talk about the eyes lighting up, my eyes lit up. And I said, that's, my, that's when I got really on that whole thing. That he gave himself over to them. They didn't take him. Because when you say, I'm he, and you fall down, that's power. So there's things in God's word that, you know, it light, it, when it connects and you connect to a truth of God in this, then that's what it can do for you, and it makes your eyes light up. In verse 9, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. So we've gone from God's world to God's Word and the importance of it. Uh, Talking to a man, he was a pro fisherman. I said, man, it must be great to, you know, get to do that for a living. He said, 
I used to love fishing until I started doing it for a living. You know, he, he didn't love it anymore. But he, he I talked to him about church and the Lord and stuff. He didn't need church. Because when he, he said, when I go out on the water, the water is my cathedral. You know, I don't need a man-made building. I can go out here in creation. But see, that's as far as that's ever going to get him. He'll never know God. He'll never know the truth about the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He'll never know about anything beyond this world because all he's ever going to know is the decaying creation of this world that is fallen and wrecked with sin, even as beautiful as it is. He'll never know anything but his little cathedral there on the water. But the truths of God and the depths of God and the things of God are going to be found in the Bible. That creation that you see out there should lead you to this book. That creation is, should lead you to say, the one who created these, the one that hung these stars, the one that made the sky, the one that created all this beauty around me, I want to learn more about him in detail. And that's supposed to bring you to this in doing that. So God's perfect law makes us see the need of conversion. You don't get that with rocks and trees. You never understand you need a Savior. You don't understand you're lost when you're... I mean, you can get lost in the woods. I started saying in the woods. But you don't understand your need for salvation from that. Verse 7 says it brings wisdom, perfect uh, brings about personal integrity. Verse 8, hearts rejoice, eyes light up. All of these things. Man presents his search for the origins of heaven. And, 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 what have we done? What have we done with the creation? What have we done with the heavens? What have we done with the skies? Well, I mean, we look up into the skies and the, 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 the stars and the things of this world and big name scientists that are so intelligent and have all the degrees and tell us God doesn't exist, and then when you push them on creation, and here we are, and, what, and they'll say, well, it could be aliens. Okay, so it can't be God. Now, if you believe in aliens, I don't have any problem with aliens. I don't, I don't. Somebody say, well, if there's aliens, isn't that going to make your faith fall apart? Absolutely not. Jesus didn't die for them no more than he died for the angels. It doesn't change a thing for me. I still need Jesus. They can get what they get wherever they get it, just like angels, if they exist. And if they don't, I don't know. It's a lot of space out there for nothing. But, you know, I don't know. But I do know this, that you've got a problem in your mind if you say there is no God. I am absolutely sure out of all the knowledge of the world right here, and I'm, I know without a shadow of a doubt God does not exist, but it could be aliens from another planet that put us here. What? It's nothing at all. If you don't want God in the picture, how are you going? Anyway, I don't know. It's just insanity. And so they, the Bible says they think they're wise. They think they're so smart. And they think we're the idiots. You just had a blind leap in faith to, to be a Christian. Well, you got a blind leap into aliens. What are you talking about? I've got millions of people that had conversion experiences that can give testimony how Jesus came into their lives and saved their souls. What do you got? Anyway, considering God's glory, let's look at verse 12 through 14. Do we want to be holy? Who perceives his unintentional sins. Cleanse me. Remember this is David. Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be innocent and cleansed from blatant rebellion. Verse 14, last one. May the words of my mouth... Now this is the famous verse. This, there's songs. This is a memorization verse. This one might... You might remember this one. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's stuff we put on banners. Okay. We don't put the rest of it, but we put that kind of stuff on banners. Y'all looking like, is it on one of these? I don't know. I don't think so. But that, that's, the, that's the one, that's the pinnacle of chapter 19 is verse 14. So considering God's glory 
and looking at the trees and stuff and seeing that kind of revelation isn't going to convict you of your sins. It's when you get into this and you get into learning about God and growing about, and you start going, oh. So now we've made a transition all through this psalm. We've gone from there must be a God who created this, look at the heavens, look at the creation, and then we get into the specifics of who this God is, and now we are left with going, oh, no, I'm a wretched sinner, God. But the beauty is the God that created the heavens and the sky and everything, you can talk to Him about it. And we shouldn't be able to. The God that hung those stars. The God that set it all in motion. The God that created all that. That God you can go to Him when you perceive your unintentional sins. You can ask Him to cleanse you from your hidden faults. You keep your servant from your willful sins. And, you know, In verse 10, he talked about gold and honey and how valuable the Word of God is. It's valuable because it shows us the state of our souls. In verse 12, he says, acquit me, uh, forgive me, uh, leave me unpunished. You know what he's saying in verse 12? Please don't whoop me. <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's like, I know I deserve a beating. You know, I deserve a whooping. Heavenly Father, I know I deserve to be chastised and everything. And I've got these sins. Cleanse me from my hidden faults. If man can be made holy, that brings glory to God. Remember, Psalms 19 is all about the glory of God. So it starts with, y'all following me? It starts with creation bringing glory to God. It goes into the Word bringing glory to God, revelation of God. But then if God can take and do these verses in you and make you holy, that brings glory to God. And that is the greatest miracle over any star hung in the sky, any tree, any bird, anything. That is the greatest miracle of everything that we could ever hope for is a, a heart of a sinful, wretched man who has come and been and made holy and righteous before a holy God because of the shed blood of Jesus. And that's what Jesus did for us. He gave His life for us. Why? To bring glory to the Father. So now we come all the way back around. What's it been about this whole time? Bring glory to God. So what's your purpose in life? To bring glory to God. That's why, Christian... If you start thinking church is about you, if you start thinking what we do around here is about you in any way, shape, or form, you're wrong. If you start thinking your very existence on this planet is about you, you're wrong. You were created to bring glory to God. And you can't do that in a sinful state we got to grasp these great things about God and cleanse us. And David, you know what he didn't do? He didn't deny his sin. He didn't run from it. He didn't hide it. He didn't delay talking about it. He dealt with it. Why? He said, I always struggle with David. I don't know about you. Not you. I looked right at you, David. But I struggle with you too, David. <laughs> Three Davids, I struggle with everyone. Four of them, I struggle with everyone. Um... I always struggled with David. I remember, you know, David was my hero. And I started reading the Bible, and y'all have heard me talk about this because we've been in Psalms, and I started seeing all the... Because the, the Bible doesn't hide the bad things about David, you know. David did some bad, bad things. But he's still like a... He's still a man after God's own heart. How can he be a man after God's own heart? How can he be celebrated so much? How can he be a hero of the church of the... Because David, even for all his faults and his sins and his wrongdoing, he really, when he came to his senses, he just wanted to please God and bring glory to God. That should bring you and me comfort to know no matter how wretched we are and whatever sin we've done, we can still bring glory to God with our lives if we'll just repent and be real about who we are. He even wanted in the verses his very thoughts to bring glory to God. 
There's been a lot of times in my life I, was, I did not bring glory to God. And if we'll all be honest, we, we got those times, right? There were periods in our lives where we just lost our minds. It could have been for a few moments today, you know. Is it over? Is it in? Is the end? The devil will tell you it is, but God doesn't say that to you. Because God doesn't, you know what God's interested in? Getting glory out of you. So he's not done with you. So let him get glory out of you. Let him get this. So, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do we want everything to be acceptable to the Lord? Father, that's our prayer. Verse 14 of chapter 19, that is our prayer. God, that we would be acceptable to you, acceptable in your sight. Thank you for Jesus. And Lord, as we get into our prayer time tonight, there, there may be some, some sin we need to confess. There may be some thanksgiving we need to express. And but Lord, help us know how we need to pray. If there's something... If you're wanting to bless us, but you can't bless us because of the, 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 the sin of our lives and our, our mindsets and what we're doing, God, reveal that to us so we can make it right. Because we want to bring glory to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right.